Join UF Hall of Famer and 14-year NFL vet Shane Matthews every weekday as he brings you all you need to know about your Florida Gators, including news, analysis, and opinions with some of the biggest names in sports. Find us on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Or watch us live at 8 a.m. on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Good morning. It's a live edition of Pot Up with Matthews in the Morning from the Crime Prevention Security System Studios, large enough to serve you, small enough to care. Uh, it's Thursday. That means we'll have our college football analyst, Brent Beard, join us here momentarily. Uh, Gators will play the Georgia Bulldogs tonight. Uh, it's tip, supposed to be 9.30 Eastern time, but don't expect that. Um, playing the late game is going to be a long night for sure. Uh, but we'll have Kevin Brockway of the Gainesville Sun break down the SEC tournament in the second portion of today's program. If you missed it, <laughs> the Gators win the AAU Division II National Championship in Hockey. How about that? Congratulations to them. Let's go to the Titan Number Hotline, courtesy of Comfort Temp. And we got our our Heisman Trophy voter, Brent Beard. Good morning, Brent. How you doing? Well, I'm doing fine. It's um, always good to be on with you. And uh, you, you gave – the listeners some good advice because that game tonight will likely not start until probably nine forty five or ten o'clock. There is a thirty minute uh, mandatory deal to where they've got uh, uh, to do some. Uh, I'm sure they've got to do some stuff to the floor, et cetera. But got got Georgia again. They should win that one, uh, and then they'll have a, uh, another game with Alabama tomorrow night. Yeah, and if it goes into overtime like the game last night did, yeah. it'll be even longer. So, yes, correct. <laughs> should be a good day if you like to watch college basketball. All the tournaments are in full action today. Also, TPC has cranked up as well. Brent, uh, we have a spring football game. If you want to tune in to ESPN or SEC Network Plus and check out the Missouri Tigers this weekend. Yeah, the um, uh, uh, now. They started early, so they want to end early. Now that game will be on ESPN Plus. I'm glad you brought that up. The Alabama spring game is the only spring game period that will be on um, ESPN uh, or even the other channels. So, uh, do you remember last year the only game? Uh, there may have been two. Uh, the Georgia spring game and the Colorado spring game were really the only two games on. Obviously, what they're trying to do is to get people to spend more money. So if you want to see your team play the spring game, uh, you end up having, unfortunately, to do that. So uh, we're we're back to that this year, similar to what we had last year. Yeah, we got um, we got a couple of some odds have come out for the Heisman Trophy for next year. A couple of, uh, well, I'd say a couple, a few SEC quarterbacks. You being a Heisman voter, out of the ones that are the top five with the best odds, which ones is Brent Beard like? Well, I, I'm still amazed that Carson Beck is uh, tied with Quinn Ewers of Texas for the top spot. It's amazing how well that he has done. Um, I do like Jackson Dart. Uh, I mean, I can see good things in all of them, frankly. Not sure I've got a, a favorite yet. Obviously, Nico Lamaliva, and we'll learn how to pronounce that before it's over, uh, at Tennessee is getting a lot of the attention, too. So, And, and again, be it good, be it bad, uh, the top – guys and the odds are all uh, again are all quarterbacks so isn't it, isn't it interesting Shane how we go in the Heisman with these uh, it's kind of trendy uh it used to be running backs for years and then we had some wide receivers and now it's kind of been quarterbacks forever yeah it's a quarterback award let's be honest um there's kind of some good news in the state of Florida regarding high school football coaches or just coaches in general uh there's talk now about them getting like a 
twenty something thousand dollar stipend, yeah. which would be astronomical compared to yeah. what they're making yeah. now. I know in Alachua County, the head football coach's stipends are three thousand five hundred dollars. Right. Think about that. Yeah, they spend countless hours year in and year out. Uh, twenty two thousand would be a lot. Be a huge, huge pay raise. Well, I've covered preps for years and and love to do it, and still go to as many games on Friday night as I can go to. And Shane is right. Uh, and look, the these guys do uh, uh, basically everything. Um, I mean, they will. Uh, I mean, they even line the field. Yeah. Uh, they they wash the uh, uh, the jerseys. I've talked to a lot of uh, coaches. I remember interviewing some of the coaches at Key- Keystone High, High School, and uh, uh, a lot of those guys, frankly, Shane, even after the game, um, they really either didn't go to bed uh, Saturday morning or they didn't go to bed until about 3 or 4 in the morning. So it, it is. It's amazing what they do. But the, the bottom line with this is, uh, I, I'm hoping this will pass, or at least some of it will. Uh, but they are the stipend um, is going to be recommended around twenty-two thousand, and then there's a certain amount for other uh, different coaches and different sports. Um, now this may be going around for a little bit. It's going to take a while that uh, they've got to go through all the committees and so forth. But I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, real quick, just to let folks know that uh, something that really needs to be done here where, and like Texas and Georgia, you've got coaches making six figures and getting a truck. Uh, and a house uh, and multiple other things. And they do, no, they do nothing but coach football. That's Look, right. I've yeah. been around a long time. The state of Florida is so backwards and, and just completely uh, – clueless when it comes to high school athletics. Agreed. Um, you know, as you mentioned, most coaches have to line the field. Uh, they have to teach classes. They have to wash the uniforms. They have to drive kids home. They have to pay out of their own pockets to feed yeah. kids. Uh, that's just, I mean, that's just what you do as a coach. But um, right. it, it's a shame how the state of Florida is. And you've lost a lot of really good high school coaches, mentors, to other states due to pay. And, um, I mean, literally the the stipend – I mean, Brent, think about a high school football coach. You know, it's not like baseball where you just have your, your season, all your kids are off playing travel ball. So, I mean, you still have to prepare, or basketball is the same way. Football is a year-round sport because you're in the weight right. room, all sure. the training in the all-season. And these guys in Alachua County – to be a head coach is make are making three thousand five hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. And, and look, something you said a minute ago is really true. I'll never forget uh, one of the Lake County coaches telling me that he was talking to one of his players uh, about uh, their nutrition program, and the player said, "Well, coach, I'd love to do that, but I, we don't have anything in our refrigerator." So he actually went out and, uh, uh, and, and got a grocery bill uh, for the guy and his family. And see, that, that goes with what you're talking about. There are things these coaches do. Uh, and look, I'm, I'm convinced some of these coaches have literally saved these players' lives in one way or another. So I'm, I'm – I'm glad to see them get anything uh, that that will improve what they're doing um, uh, on a daily basis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The most important coach in an athlete's career is their high school coach because of the age they are trying to guide them in the right direction, make good yes. decisions. And uh, th- there's no question. High school coaches need to be paid a lot. Uh, Daryl says on the Titan Mark text line, give the money to the coaches. Please know NIL in high school in Florida. They're talking about that, which is just totally ridiculous. It is. Um, Josh has a question for you here, uh, Brent, on Facebook Live brought to you by Mel Law. He wants to know, how did Ole Miss get all those QBs in their quarterback room? They have high-rated recruits, and a lot of them aren't going to play. 
Well, but they like to compete, and they like to play for Lane Kiffin, uh, and they think if they go to Ole Miss and Lane Kiffin, that even though they won't, they may not start, that they will learn. Help me on this, Shane. That they will learn enough from Kiffin uh, about being a quarterback that that is going to help them on the next level. I mean, I, it's a good question. And I get that in that can you have too many quarterbacks in the same room? I mean, I guess you could, uh, depending. But a lot of these guys, they are not afraid of competition, uh, and they want to learn from one of the best. So that's why they're there. Yeah. Um, Brent, also a couple of days ago, Nick Saban and I think Rick Byrne, a couple other people were up on uh, talking with Congress, Capitol yes. Hill about the NIL. Want to give us a Cliff Notes version of what went, what went on there? Yeah, Nick Saban was uh, shown sitting next to Ted Cruz, the senator from Texas, and they were discussing the uh, uh, the NIL and where college football uh, was going. And so what Saban said, and I'll quote here, if we revenue shared a certain amount, uh, it'd be the same in each state. The issue, that's the issue right now. We don't have that. Uh, we have collectives in some states raising huge amounts of money and competing against those who don't have that kind of money, uh, too. Now, there's a couple of opinion pieces I wanted to mention here real quick on what he said. Um, and this is from Albert Breer. What I think Saban is getting at, kids are going to three or four different schools they're not getting developed properly. They're not getting a degree or plugged into professional networks or after football. Uh, and it's and is it really worth a couple hundred thousand if they get lost uh, in the uh, in the weeds <clears throat> with others? There was another one that Aaron Torres said: kids want to get paid, and they should be. But the number one unintended consequence of this era is kids going to three or four schools chasing the bag, running them out of eligibility and ending up without a degree. When will we discuss this? So I just wanted to, to throw out what Saban said uh, and some opinions on that. Greg Byrne, the Alabama AD, also said, if it wasn't for football, we would not have 21 sports at the University of Alabama. We do not want to see college sports lose women's sports and in and, and Olympic sports. Well, that's the route uh, so, that's going right now from what I've been hearing, is. that uh, with all the nonsense of this money being paid to mostly football and basketball players, that a lot of these sports are going to be weeded out. They just can't afford them. Um, we had a Facebook Live question here from Tim. wanted to know how did Arch Manning get paid so much in high school? He didn't get paid in high school. Uh, right. He's getting paid at the University of Texas. Um, he went to, to Newman High School in New Orleans, but he was not paid in high school. No. Uh, Brent, the projected SEC win totals have come out. Not not a whole lot of surprises. A couple of SEC teams, I forgot, have some extremely easy schedules. Uh, Florida's one of them that's not. Coach Spurrier's that's already right. gone on record saying the Gators are going to win nine games yet next year. Um, I haven't given my – prediction yet but you want to go through a couple of the projected sec win yeah. totals yeah i'd be glad to uh georgia 10 and a half uh now georgia has a much tougher schedule uh, they've got clemson and atlanta they go to alabama they go to texas and they go to Ole miss the texas is 10 and a half too um which would be interesting um to see how that goes uh, also, Texas goes to Michigan. That's one of the highlights of the non-conference schedule. Ole Miss is nine and a half. How about that, Shane? Uh, some love for the Rebels, and I would agree with that. Now, may not be tested until mid-October, but they go to LSU, Oklahoma, and Georgia. Alabama, nine and a half. Missouri, nine and a half. And Tennessee, nine and a half. LSU nine and a half. So you've got a a group there uh, of those uh, schools. Uh, obviously, we mentioned Nico a few minutes ago at Tennessee. They go to they play NC State in Charlotte and Oklahoma 
at Georgia, and they have Alabama in Knoxville, Oklahoma seven and a half, uh, which is will be interesting to see how that goes over. A and M eight and a half under Mike Elko, Auburn seven and a half, Florida again five and five and a half, which is kind of what you basically are seeing right now. South Carolina, Arkansas five and a half, Mississippi State four and a half, and, and Vanderbilt two and a half. So. Any any surprises there, Shane? No, I mean I, I Missouri probably has the easiest schedule of anybody in the SEC. Yeah, uh, obviously Florida's may be the hardest in the history of college football, but like I've really? said many times, embrace it and see what happens. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a couple of injuries here or there, you never know could change the outcome uh, of any of these teams. So, you know, we'll talk more about it throughout the summer, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, Florida's is probably like it's right where it was last year, and, and they didn't win. I, I could have sworn they'd win seven or eight games, and technically yeah. they should have won seven. They should uh, have. They did, yeah. yeah. Um, the note here about the uh, FBS programs that won eight-plus games for four straight seasons kind of surprised me. Yeah, what about that? That that, that was interesting. Uh, uh, only seven having won an eight-plus in four straight years. Alabama, Clemson. How about Coastal Carolina, Shane? <laughs> Georgia, yeah. Liberty, NC State, and Notre Dame. Now, look, we we really never talk about NC State as being a championship team, but look, um, you played on all levels and you get it. Uh, Shane, if you win eight-plus games in four straight years, that's a decent run, isn't it? Well, obviously, I mean, there's only, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven teams that have done it. Yeah. Um, yep. So it's that's pretty interesting, that stat right there. Speaking with Brent Beard here on the Titan of Our Hotline, courtesy of Comfort Temp, Rad wears a family-owned business that prides itself in excellent customer service while providing quality and affordable promotional products and customized apparel. We'll have Kevin Brockway in the second portion talk a little hoops. Uh, a lot of people talking about here about how coaches – influence kids you know there's that saying out there that a that a coach influences more people in a year than the average person does in a lifetime and i'll uh, tell you who, I, yeah i'll I tell you who said that. that uh i'll tell you who said that was billy graham is that who uh, it was yeah what well, somebody was talking to billy one day about how many people he has influenced in his ministry and he he said uh a a coach influences uh, much more people than I ever will. Yeah, I agree with that a thousand percent. And I feel like the high school coach, because the of the ages, you know, from that yes. 15 to 18 year yes. old, you know, you can make some bad decisions at that age. Um, yep. So hopefully they get this thing fixed for the uh, high school coaches here in the state of Florida. Brent, let's go around the SEC. What's going on in Alabama? Uh, they've started practice, obviously, under Kalen DeBoer. Uh, which is very odd with Saban yeah, not being there. But what, what can you tell us coming out of Tuscaloosa? Yeah, so far so good. They had a big um, commitment the other day. Zamir Smith, he's a four-star athlete from uh, Ridgely, Maryland, uh, chose Alabama. Derek Smith was another commitment, the number two player in the state of Alabama. So the point is, Kalen DeBoer is recruiting rather well so far. Caleb Odom is a six foot five tight end. That they, they have moved a wide receiver. He's Alabama's tallest receiver. Six foot five matched up on a five ten cornerback would be a, uh, certainly in their favor. And again, if folks tune in late, um, Alabama spring game uh, will be on ESPN, similar to what Colorado did last year. The only spring game. That will be televised live. Arkansas, uh, they lost a coach to TCU. Any word on who they may be hiring? Yeah, they're still trying to figure that out, I believe. But Jimmy Smith, their running backs coach, went to uh, uh, TCU. Okay, Kobe Smith, uh, former Miami Dolphin assistant, is a possibility to replace him. I did want to mention, too, uh, that folks may have uh, forgotten about this. 
But Bobby Petrino is back at Arkansas. He was at A&M. Jimbo kind of tied his hands when he was there. Uh, but he's back at Arkansas running the offense. Um, and I think they will certainly be better. Arkansas's defensive line was one of their few bright spots last year. But they've still got guys on that line. Landon Jackson, who is 6'7", 282, is one of their better players on the defensive line. So, again, Sam Pittman, Shane, is is working to save his job uh, in uh, bringing in uh, Petrino. Certainly is, is one way, hopefully, to try to do that for him. Any news uh, with in the Gator camp? Obviously, they've only had a couple of practices, and they, they, they broke for spring break. They'll start back next week. Uh, any news in Gainesville? You know, one thing I didn't know about or, or had forgotten about Russ Calloway, Russ Calloway is the son of longtime football coach Neil Calloway. Do you remember Neil? Mm-hmm. Uh, Neil was Neil was at Alabama. He coached at UAB. So, I mean, the bloodlines were there. Uh, certainly with that, I, I did think it was um, um, <clears throat> Jamarcus Weston has changed positions um, again. Um, so, uh, that'll be interesting to see how uh, how he does moving outside linebacker. But as you know, in going through many springs, um, springs is a time to experiment, isn't it, Shane? You move some guys around, see how they will do. You get a little bit of tape on it. And then they decide, well, do we want to keep him at his old position or maybe move him to this new one? Yeah. What's going on in uh, Athens? They started spring on Tuesday. Um, so um, they are kind of rebuilding, if you want to call it that. <laughs> uh, frankly, they've got a lot of guys they're trying to get back from injury. Bo Hewley had a shoulder surgery, and they think that, that he will be back. Chris Jones um, had surgery on his foot. Christian Miller had a meniscus. Um, small, the um, linebacker. Uh, had a stress fracture, um, and they're, they're hoping he'll be back soon, too. Uh, Ray Ray Thomas, uh, the wide receiver, had a foot injury. He won't be at full speed, uh, but he, he still will be there. Um, so, look, th- this team's still loaded. There's no question about it. Um, they, they'll have a lot of these guys who won't be doing a whole lot. And obviously, that they've lost a lot of players. Um, also, um, Dejon Edwards at running back, Marcus Rosemey, Jack Saint, the wide receiver. He seemed to seem like he was there six or seven years. Brock Bowers obviously is gone. One of their big losses is Cedric Van Pran, uh, their center, who, who is really good, uh, and he'll make it in the NFL. So uh, they lose a lot of talent, but they've got a whole lot coming back. Live a healthier lifestyle with our bowl, flavorful smoothies, and our amazing food. Tropical smoothie. When you eat better, you feel better. A few more minutes with Brent Beard here on the Titan MR Hotline. He's our Heisman Trophy and college football analyst. LSU had a lot of turnover on their defense side of the ball. They lose the Heisman Trophy uh, winner. What's going on in Baton Rouge? Well, they are excited about a new year. Um, they're excited about Nesmeyer being their um, a quarterback. Uh, the the thing that they've done, and we've and we've said this a lot, but it bears repeating. They've hired a lot of coaches to replenish this defense and, and get them up to speed. They were abysmal last year defensively, um, but they brought in the Missouri coordinator. They brought in Corey Raymond from Florida. They brought in Bo uh, Bo Davis from uh, Texas. Uh, so I think that's something that they will be uh, working on and that they will be excited about. Their offensive line, um, I think, is going to be good. Uh, frankly, they've got Josh Williams coming back at tailback. This is going to be a really good team. And and one of the early games that Shane and I need to get press credentials for is they play 
Southern Cal in Las Vegas uh, oh, that's early, right. early in the season. How about that one, Shane? Uh, you know, we, but we, we could find you a golf course out there somewhere, couldn't we, bud? <laughs> yeah, there's no question. There's some good ones out there for sure. Uh, Missouri has a new quarterback, and, and the kid, I swear he's been in college already like five years, and he still has yep. three years left. Really? That's a good point. Drew Pine, uh, he was at Arizona State, and then he was at Notre Dame. Uh, but he is committed to Missouri. Now, Brady Cook is still the quarterback. So I guess this is preparing for the future, isn't it, Shane? Uh, Cook will have probably one more year, and then he'll go to the NFL maybe. Uh, but Pine is 8-2. and two. As a starter at Notre Dame and is four and one against top twenty five teams, so folks may not remember him necessarily, but uh, he he is a decent quarterback that will certainly help them. You remember Luther Burden, Shane? Uh, yeah. uh, Burden Burden comes back too, so uh, <laughs> uh, he 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 is a handful, is he not? <laughs> yeah, he's a heck of a player, no question. Andy's question for you, Brent, on Facebook, brought to you by Mel Law. He wants your take on Jackson Dart's private jet NIL deal. <laughs> I, I yeah. tip my hat to Jackson Dart. That's a hell of a deal. I don't know how many hours he gets, but uh, I don't. I don't know if he's from California. He may be from like Oregon or somewhere. I know he's from the West Coast, so yeah. maybe it's a quick way for him to get back to the West Coast to see his friends and family. It could be. And what Andy's asking about is Jackson Dart, the Ole Miss quarterback. Sign an NIL deal uh, uh, that involves uh, a private plane and, and being able to lend his name, image, and likeness to that company. Uh, so, yeah, th that's a unique deal, frankly, and we're seeing some of these unique things kind of go up. So, congratulations to him. Can, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure that um, Lane Kiffin has. Uh, uh, I had some very amusing conversation with him over that, such as let me borrow your plane. Uh, and well, so Lane, Lane, Lane flies that damn Ole Miss plane a lot because his, he uh, does, don't his he? kids, well, some of his kids are in school at Ole Miss, but he's still got some kids out on the West Coast. Right. Uh, so I'm sure he right. flies the school plane out there. We have a text on the Titan Mark text line from George. Uh, he says, Brent, what is the latest on Florida, Georgia staying in Jacksonville? Well, uh, they are still negotiating. Frankly, a lot of this in Jacksonville has to do with uh, they're trying to get a new stadium deal and redo the stadium and add a lot of, um, uh, I guess, entertainment uh, venues downtown. They're still working on that, but that has not been done yet. Um, again, the uh, we'll play here in Jacksonville in, in, uh, this year and next year. And then after that, it's, it's, it's still open. So, um, it, look, they're still talking. They're still negotiating. I mean, they're probably not doing it every day, but, but I mean, they stay on it pretty steady and hoping to get something done with that, uh, that that's in the works. But, uh, again, there's so many things that are going on involving that and and i would i would guess we'll probably hear more on that uh sometime in the next couple of months as the uh stadium negotiations are going on we have a new mayor and donna deegan who also was at first coast news where i'm where i work with them um as our college football analyst and one of don one of the things donna's trying to do is get the stadium done and obviously uh um, keep the uh, Florida-Georgia game uh, here in Jacksonville. No doubt. Brent, give us a few nuggets before we get you out of here. Yep, I will be glad to do that. Um, uh, Florida State is – they open practice next Tuesday. Miami is already practicing. By the way, Reuben Bain is going to stay at defensive end. He's really good. Now – what I will end with uh, will be the negotiations. There was, uh, as far as the college football playoff is concerned, they actually, I'll, I'll make, be quick on this, but they actually came up with a breakdown for the money, and that, got, that, 
that is in the works, but the, the story got out yesterday from Ross Dellinger. The uh, SEC will get 29% of the money. The Big Ten will get 29% of the money. Notice the figures here, Shane. The ACC will get 17% of the money. The Big 12 will get 15% of the money. And the G5 will get 9%. And the independents will get uh, the rest of that. So, Shane, when you hear those percentages, basically 30-30 for the Big Two. And then ACC is 17%. <laughs> Can you see why these schools want to get out of the ACC and join the um, – SEC or the Big Ten. Yeah, no doubt about it. Brent, great stuff as always. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you next week. Always enjoy it, bud. Take care. That's Brent Beard, our college football analyst. Join us on the Titan More Hotline, courtesy of Comfort Tent. We're going to take a quick timeout. Come back, talk a little hoops. Big game tonight for the Gators against the Dogs. You're watching and listening to Pot with Matthews in the morning from the Crime Prevention Security System Studios. We want to take this moment to thank our sponsors who keep the show going and pay the bills. Our premium sponsors are Crime Prevention Security Systems, large enough to serve you, small enough to care. Titan MRI, Gainesville's only locally owned and operated MRI facility. Meldon Law, the only official injury and accident law attorneys of the Florida Gators. Peachland Dental, Gator Nation's first choice for dentistry in Port Charlotte. QC Kinetics, live pain-free with QC Kinetics. Campus USA, put some star power to work in your financial life with Campus USA Credit Union. Dave & Buster's, eat, drink, play, watch. Radware, your local provider of promotional products, uniforms, and apparel. Our gridiron sponsors are Auto ER, UF Bookstores, Silverback Concrete, Comfort Temp, Ruse Ogre State Farm Insurance, Radware, F45, Quality Plumbing, our touchdown sponsors are Adams Ribs, Gator Dominoes, Celebrate Primary Care, Gator Bait Media, Okito America, Style Cuts, Ironwood Golf Course, Big Mills Cheese Steak, McDonald's of Gainesville, 84 Lumber, Dowling Signs, Baker Sporting Goods, Silver Q Billiards and Sports Bar. If you're interested in promoting your business on the show, call Freddie at 352-284-3733. If you like what we're doing here, make sure to follow us and support the businesses that support us. Pro football legend Emmett Smith understands your joint pain. It does not surprise me that there are a ton of people out there that's in pain. That's why Emmett is such a proponent of QC Kinetics, offering real lasting joint pain relief with non-surgical, all-natural biologic treatments. Whether it's a joint pain, ankle pain, shoulder pain, neck pain, back pain, hip pain, any kind of pain, the body eventually will break down when it's under that much stress. That stress can cloud your judgment to the point that you'll just say yes to the scalpel or yes to another prescription of pain pills. But maybe it's time for a second opinion from QC Kinetics. The reason why I would recommend this is because the natural biologics that QC Kinetics is providing you gives your body a chance to naturally heal itself. Restorative regenerative solutions are here. Get lasting relief and live your life. Call QC Kinetics 352-400-4550. That's 352-400-4550. QC Kinetics 352-400-4550. Welcome back to the Crime Prevention Security System Studios. Large enough to serve you, small enough to care. Ruse Ogre State Farm Office is a team of dedicated insurance professionals ready to help life go right with the right insurance options for you and your family. Visit ogreinsurance.com. Give them a call at 352-240-1779. We're going to go back to the Titan More Highline courtesy of Comfort Temp. We're joined by Gainesville Sons, Kevin Brockway. Good morning, Kevin. How you doing, bud? Good morning, Shane. How are you? So, Kevin, I, I know last night you were having a little fun with some friends. Well, you were at a karaoke place. Uh, what, what was your songs you sang last night? <laughs> uh, you know, it's kind of funny because, uh, you know, it's the 44-year anniversary this week of Glass Houses. So I decided to do a little Billy Joel, You May Be Right. And uh, it was a big hit with the crowd. I did that. And a uh, little Gin Blossoms, Hey Jealousy. So it was a good night. And, uh, you know, my good buddy Curtis Mesnard was there. And he's a big fan of the show. So uh, we had a... He and his wife, we had a good time. Good deal, good deal. All right, the Gators uh, are going to be playing Mike White and the Bulldogs once again. Mike White hasn't beaten <laughs> the Gators since he's been a Bulldog coach. 
Uh, just your thoughts leading into this game. Uh, I mean, obviously, we all think Florida's the better team, should win, but it's tournament time. You never know what can happen. What do the Gators need to do tonight to advance to play Alabama? Well, first and foremost, they better know where Blue Keen is at all times uh, because he really lit it up in that game last night. I think he was five and nine from three and really brought him back in the second half. I think he's the guy you got to kind of deny the basketball and limit his, you know, three point attempts because he can really get on a roll. Um, you know, last time Thomason had a big game against him as well. Justin Hill, the guard. I mean, they're a guard heavy team. That's the strength of their team. I, you know, I, I think their big guys are, are kind of limited. So you're going to have to blanket their guards a little bit. And I think for Florida too, it's, uh, you know, just a matter of, uh, you know, executing well, obviously holding leads. That's been the storyline all season. You know, uh, obviously Florida's a team that, that's very good when they get up and down in transition, but have really kind of showed that that killer instinct in the second half. And, uh, you know, executing the little things. I mean, you know, you know, it's kind of funny. The Vanderbilt game, you look back on it, and uh, obviously a, a terrible call at the end of the game, but if you still execute that inbounds under, uh, you know, on, uh, underneath the basket, up 78 77 and get fouled you probably you know find a way to win that game um and it's kind of funny because i chided florida about that and then i watched the vandy arkansas game and vandy did that twice to arkansas in the last two minutes yeah. overtime so they were playing pretty desperate under stackhouse but inbounding under pressure that's been a big problem all season long and and facing pressure too and uh you know george is going to throw it at them and they're going to you know m- that's mike white style he's going to try to force turnovers here and there so being strong with the basketball as well as I think it's going to be really important and, uh, you know, making good decisions and, you know, not, not turning it over after, you know, having 16 turnovers against Vandy. Um, sp- moving away from the Gators for a minute. Do you think Vanderbilt makes a move with uh, Jerry Stackhouse? You know, it's interesting because there are a lot of people around the league that respect Jerry Stackhouse um, in particular for how he runs half court offense, his sets, are, you know, a lot of people think are as good as any coach in the league. Um, you know, they have a talent issue there. They're talking about, you know, building, uh, I guess, a new uh, facility there that's going to help with recruiting. Um, so, you know, I guess you wonder, like, what else is out there with, with him? And I will respect the fact that, you know, when you watch that game last night and when you watch the game against Florida, they they play hard for him. They, they're still playing very hard, but they're a team that gets decimated and victimized by the transfer portal. And obviously because of their academic standards, it's hard for them to bring transfers in. So it's a tough situation there. Um, And um, he's had five years. I think it'll be dicey. I think it'll be 50, 50 either way. But um, if they commit to him for next year, I don't think it would be a terrible move. You know, I think that, you know, he's, he's three and one against Todd Golden, amazingly enough. And even the game that Todd won against them, I mean, Florida was at home and, and, Stackhouse, you know, threw everything at him. I think he's a good X's and O's coach. I, I think he just needs a little more talent. I think that whole academic standards is a little overrated for the athlete because I have some people that I know that have coached at Duke in multiple sports. And if you're a decent, a decent academically, you don't have to be great. They will get you in as an athlete. I don't know if yep. Vanderbilt does that, but if Duke does it, maybe Vandy needs to tweak their stuff. Um, I wanted to ask you today, you know, right now there's six SEC teams that are locked into the tournament, uh, basically the top six teams' uh, yeah. seeds in the tournament. You got Mississippi State and A&M who are kind of on the bubble, first four in, first four out, all that kind of nonsense. Do they both need to win today? I think so, yeah. yeah. I, maybe Mississippi State is a little leeway, but Texas A&M definitely has to win today. I think that's a must win for them, um, given where they are. but. Um, you know, uh, Mississippi State probably if they lose two, that would that would probably be because you have the specter of a team like Indiana State, you know, that's in the wings, uh, St. John's, uh, what they've done. Um, and um, I think some committee members are human. I mean, I think they would look at Indiana State as an interesting storyline because Avila. They would look at St. John's as an interesting storyline because of Rick Pitino. Um, and, um, you know, you're supposed to go strictly by the numbers, but uh you know, you, you can't let everyone in. So I think it's imperative for both of them to take care of their business. I mean, it would be interesting if Texas A&M makes a run, um, you could have eight teams in there, right? And that would be really something uh, for the SEC uh, to get all eight of them in. So uh, I, I think that that's what makes this weekend uh, 
Interesting. I, I think it's kind of tricky, though, because over the years I've seen this, there are some years where the selection committee will take into account teams that make runs in conference tournaments, you know, that are like Texas A&M. Other years I've seen it, you know, completely opposite, where they just kind of have their mind made up. So uh, it's 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 just really hard to know, you know, what those guys are thinking in that room uh, heading into Sunday. The Aggies have a lot of quad one really good wins, but they got some just horrible <laughs> losses too. So <laughs> I, I think it's important for them to make make a deep run, and I I think they have the team that they can do it. And I think the Buzz is a really good coach, so we'll see what, what happens there. One thing I'll say, uh, based on my uh, experience and kind of tracking it. I think the committee takes more into account quality wins than they do bad losses. I think they really weight that. So that could work in Texas A&M's favor. I think they kind of a flush or expect the fact that you're going to have bad losses here and there. Now, you know, you don't want to have a terrible, terrible record, but I think the quad one wins will play well for Texas A&M on Sunday if, if they get, you know, picked. Dan wants to know on Facebook Live brought to you by Mel Law. Do you think they'll ever expand the tournament? Right now we're at 68 teams. You think they add any more? Yeah, well, they've been talking about it the last few years. I think you know it's kind of interesting because there are a lot of people that say, "Hey, it's great now, don't screw it up." But when you look at the number one number of Division One teams, it's three fifty, and you've got you know right now sixty eight. So that's like twenty percent postseason competition, you know, uh, uh, participation. And then you look at football and FBS, and you've got a hundred bowl teams out of one hundred thirty or. Well, no, maybe not 100, what, 60, 70, right? It's somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 or 40 bowl games, but that's like 50% participation. So I think that the NCAA is looking into finding more ways to get teams into the postseason because they don't want, you know, guys laying up at the end of the year, you know, not playing or um, they, 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 I think they want to give a sense of hope. I, I'm of the belief, though, that every team gets a shot because of the conference tournaments. I mean, there are a few big leagues that don't qualify all their teams. And I think that's wrong, but I, I think that's the best way to do it is that, you know, you get your shot this weekend uh, to, uh, to get that automatic bin. Yep. For sure. A text on the tight number no text line from Kevin. He says, what's the effect of Georgia playing last night and turning around to play the Gators tonight? Who's had a day all. I mean, obviously their legs – I mean, they had to come from behind, right? I went to bed, but didn't Georgia have to come from behind? Yeah, they did, Shane, and I think that's interesting because I think they did expend a lot of energy kind of making that run. I mean, they were down – I think it was 59-52 with about four or five minutes to go, and they closed the game on a 12-0 run. I mean, Missouri took some terrible shots uh, during that stretch. Uh, Nick Honor was, uh, you know, uh, taking fallback three-pointers and so forth. The shot selection for Missouri was not good. Um, or you could credit Mike White's defense uh, at Georgia. I mean, they did uh, – they played with a lot of desperation. So, yeah, I think that there is something to it. I've seen it over the years in conference tournaments. You know, there is that advantage there. And if you um, – you know, and particularly in the first half, I think that, uh, you know, their legs might be a little weary. So that's why I think it's important for Florida to get off to a good start and to, um, you know, um, quote, unquote, take their will. You know what I mean? If you can extend that 10- to 20-point lead – uh, into the second half, um, you know, that that's, uh, you know, something that uh, would would play well. But, of course, with Florida, I mean, the key has always been finishing, you know, that, that last 10-minute stretch, how you play, what pace you play. Uh, we've rarely seen him do it. We did see him do it against Arkansas, Alabama. We saw him do it against Auburn. Um, but a lot of other games, they've, they've let teams creep back in, and especially teams that are worse than Alabama, and uh, and uh, Arkansas and and certainly Auburn uh, in those situations. So I think it's going to be up to Florida to kind of keep the foot on the gas. Um, I think Florida's depth will play well. Obviously, you know you can go to Condon, you can go to Hauk, you can uh, Denzel Aberdeen is a guy that's been playing better lately, uh, particularly defensively. Um, Riley Kugel obviously still a bit of an enigma, but is a guy that. Uh, you know, what he's on, you know, can contribute and help you and give you some points as well. Uh, Bobby in Pensacola in the Titan MR text line says, Kevin, do you think Zion Pullen's the best point guard the Gators have ever had? No, no. He's good. He's pretty, he's really good. And he's, uh, you know, it's just turnover ratio of four to one, but uh, both ends, um, Scotty Wilbekin was player of the year. 
and Scotty could do it on both ends. Um, so he's a guy that uh, I, I just think that is, you know, got him to a final four. Um, I think he is um, probably the best. And Torian too, you know, you'd have to put Torian up there. There have been a lot of good ones. I mean, Anthony Robertson was a scorer, but he, he was another guy that was a little lazy on defense. I mean, heck, I mean, the most dynamic, I mean, but, I don't know if you count him. He only played 31 games as Jason Williams. I mean, he was. Oh, white chocolate was pretty damn good. Cer- yeah. cer- certainly, certainly pretty good, you know, and uh, some people would go back to Andrew Moten too. I mean, there've been a lot of good ones, but I'm going to put my money. I'm going to put my money on Scotty. I think Scotty's tremendously underrated because of, of what he could do on both ends of the floor. And he was a guy that developed and stayed for four years. And by the time he was a senior was, was really darn good. Uh, Andy has a good question here. Uh, I'll give you my answer as well. He says, Kevin, how, how will Kugel's four turnovers or to Vandy impact his playing time tonight? Yeah, I think he'll be on a short leash, you know, with regards to that. Like if he comes in and he turns it over again. Um, and don't forget the inbound play, too. He probably could have come back for the ball a little better at the end of the game. Although, you know, Walter Clayton made a bad bounce pass, too, on that play. Uh, but they were both a little complicit there as well. Um, and it, it was interesting how much Todd rode Riley at the end of that Vandy game, but he kind of had to because Will Richard was in foul trouble. Um, and, and Riley did hit a big shot that put him up uh, a couple of points along the baseline too. But uh, I, I do think, yeah, he, you know, if, if he's not focused, um, you know, we'll see what Todd usually does, which is, you know, sit him for the rest of the game. It's just going to be a matter of uh, – if he comes out and he, he plays with good energy and, and is smart with the basketball, you know, he's a guy that uh, a lot of times dribbles into trouble. I mean, that's his, that's his biggest issue. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes his passes aren't as crisp as they need to be, but uh, yeah, taking care of the ball, that's going to be a big priority. I mean, Todd values that Todd values rebounding obviously. And that was a big disappointment in the Vandy game. I mean, they're going to have to play tough. Um, I think they do match up pretty well with Georgia in that regard. Um, in terms of, you know, especially if they can get, you know, some of their bigs in foul trouble, which Florida's capable of doing. I think Florida will have a, a good day on the boards because Mike tends to like to play smaller anyway. Yeah. Silverback Concrete builds firm yeah. foundations for generations. You stand on it, we stand by it. We got Kevin Brockway from the Gainesville Sun here for a few more minutes before we get out of here today. A uh, couple questions for you here, Kevin. Somebody asked earlier, and obviously we haven't seen the bracket or who's in the tournament, but somebody was asking and it went away because Facebook, I can only see a couple of questions here. Um, what mid majors can make a run deep in the tournament, maybe to the final four, kind of how FAU did last year. I have three teams that I don't know if they'll make it to the final four, but three teams that, that I know two are in one's on the bubble right now that I think are outstanding basketball teams. I'll give you my three, and then you, and maybe some of the – I think Jackson, Samford, and Indiana State are really good basketball teams. I like Indiana State, and um, don't count out Dusty again at FAU. I think I think they've yeah. got enough in them. I think they are um, – you know, it's it's been an up-and-down year for them in the, uh, the American, but I still like Elijah Martin. I think he's a – a really good player, and I think their big guy, Golden, if he can play well, he's kind of the key to them with FAU. If he plays well, they tend to uh, they tend to play well. If he, you know, he had a big game against Memphis, um, but if he doesn't show up, then then they have problems. But uh, I, I would say FAU and Indiana State. I love Avila. I love that uh, you know uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, and he's just a fun guy to watch. And and they just you know they're very well coached. You know, he's he's a very he's a terrific coach, Kurt. So they're I, I think they're a team that but you know, you gotta see if they get in first. I mean, you know, right. and then Drake could be another team. You know, I, I like both those teams from the Missouri Valley. Yeah, Drake, Drake, I agree. They're a good team as well. Uh how about Donnie Jones and the Stetson Hatters making it? It's first time ever, right? Yes, yes. And I'm very happy for Donnie. He's a great guy. Um, he was one of my favorite assistants to deal with uh during that era at Florida. You know, then, you know, he went to UCF and he, he coached Michael Jordan's kid. Um, I remember they beat Florida once in a head-to-head matchup down at Amway. Um, but um, it didn't necessarily completely work out for him. He recruited Taco Fall also, Donnie did, uh, at, uh, uh, you know, at uh, UCF. Uh, and uh, 
you know, did some good things at Marshall too. So I, I'm, you know, happy to see him uh, at, uh, at Stetson and uh, seeing him do well, because I, I think he's a good uh, basketball. And, and Jonathan Mitchell was on his staff for a while. I think he left last year. He was another former Gator. So, um, so Donnie, yeah, for him to uh, stick with it and coaching and go to the tournament is, uh, is good. I think. Um. And again, we haven't seen the brackets for next for the NCAA tournament, but I wanted to get your thoughts. Out of the SEC teams, which teams do you think can make the deepest runs? I, my personal three are Tennessee, Kentucky, and Florida. I just I think Florida has a mixture of tremendous guards and bigs that can move. We all know a, we don't play great defense. That's fine, um, but I just think those three. I think Auburn sometimes has trouble scoring. I watch Alabama. I think they rely on the three too much. Um, who am I missing there? And South Carolina just bores the hell out of me. <laughs> so uh, my three would be Tennessee, Florida, and Kentucky. What about you? I like Tennessee. I agree. I like Kentucky. I like Florida. I think South Carolina could be better than you think, even though they do play a boring brand. I think they're just tough-minded. and I think No, I, I agree with that. I just I guess my- mentally I don't like watching yeah. them play. <laughs> But I think this could be the year that Rick Barnes gets to the Final Four. I just think that, you know, because his teams always play tough defense, but this year he has connect. He has the one guy that can kind of carry you in a big game, you know, and I think he's the real deal. And I think they've missed that in previous seasons where they haven't had that that score, that offense that could do really well. So I, I think this I think this might finally be the year that, that the Vols get there. And I know that uh, some Gator fans won't like to hear. As for Florida, I mean, their profile to me is very similar to Miami last year. I mean, Miami wasn't a good defensive team, but they had those three guards and those four guards. And their guards were maybe a little bigger and they were more wing players, but they were dynamic and they could get to the basket. And, uh, you know, Florida, if they get the right matchups like Miami did last year, you know, they could, you know, they could surprise and they could maybe get to the lead eight or final four. Um, you know, you talk about defense and, and I look at the little details too, like the set plays under the basket and handling pressure and, and how they handle leads. But if they get the right matchups, I think it's important, obviously, for them to hold the seven seed line. That's where they're projected now. You know, maybe you can, you know, move up to a six if, if you upset Auburn. But um, staying away from that eight, nine game is obviously critical. Now, you know, anything can happen in the tournament. I mean, FAU was an eight last year and Purdue got upset. Um, but, uh, you know, those things very rarely happen. So, you know, if, if you can stay away from the one, I mean, I think Houston would be a terrible matchup in, in an oh, eight. Well, one. Yeah. Uh, we don't want that uh, one. <laughs> whereas Purdue, whereas Purdue in an eight one might not be a bad matchup. So, um, you know, it, it's, you know, so, so it, it's, you know, it's, it's a matchup, you know, situation, I think with, with regards to that, but I think you'd like to be a seven, you'd like to be a six. Um, twos and threes are a lot more beatable, you know, in the round of 32 than, than ones are. Yeah, I agree 100% with that. Kevin, let everybody know how they can follow you on Twitter and read your stuff at the Gainesville Sun. Yeah, Gainesville.com and uh, Gatorsports.com. Good stuff as always. Appreciate your time, my man. All right, thank you, Shana. All right, uh, Dan says here, Lenardi has Florida in the Midwest where Purdue would be awful. Well, yeah, we'll see. Uh, enjoy the game tonight. Get your rest because it's going to be uh, a late one. We'll recap it tomorrow. Have a great day, folks. Take care.